Ladies and gentlemen, the next session is sponsored by Consumers Energy. Please welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer of Consumers Energy, Patty Poppy. Well, good morning. It is my privilege to represent the people of Consumers Energy in welcoming Walter Isaacson to the stage. Um, his dossier is long and accomplished. Uh, he's currently the president of the Aspen Institute, uh, but formerly was chairman and, CE uh, and CEO of CNN. He was also managing uh, editor at Time, and many of us know he's written some amazing biographies. And every time I read one, the next one, he, he does better than the one before. And you keep imagining, how can he keep doing such a great job? Ben Franklin and Einstein and Steve Jobs, and then most recently, uh, the Innovators. A great compilation of a century of innovation, geeks and geniuses who have created the digital re revolution. But I have an idea while he's here in Michigan. I think we might be able to encourage him to pick one of our great Michigan heroes. And maybe, maybe Henry Ford, or, or modern day Mary Barra, or maybe uh, Barry Gordy, I hear he's a big music fan, he's from New Orleans. Uh, so maybe we can talk him into uh, doing a Michigan story next, but rumor has it, Leonardo da Vinci is his uh, uh, next one, and we all can't wait for that to come out. So it is my privilege, please help me welcome Walter Isaacson to the stage, let's give him a pure Michigan welcome. That great and thank you Poppy for sponsoring this I really appreciate it I'm going to do a biography of Poppy next if you're kind of wondering what it's about but you do have great people in Michigan I Daniel Howes will be out here in a moment we were just talking about the Ford family and what Michigan and Detroit has had I see Mayor Archer and others has been the ability to always be innovative and creative and this is all the more important now because there are a lot of people who thought Detroit would never bounce back the way it did. But it did so because of a combination of ingredients that I want to talk about today. That's the ability to be creative, to be co collaborative, and to be civil, to be civic, to work together as a community. You know, I'm from New Orleans. That's how I got to know Sandy when he was working for this younger President Bush, and he really helped New Orleans come back after the storm. And we think in New Orleans that we're somewhat resilient, because we didn't even know we would exist now. But when we look at Detroit, we see the ability to use a creative economy to bring back a city that had been teetering after the collapse of a pure manufacturing economy. And so the first ingredient to me is this notion of creativity. One thing that Detroit and New Orleans share is that there are creative cultures that are able to connect that creativity to business. In fact, Detroit and New Orleans created the only two great indigenous music forms in this country, jazz and then Motown and the whole collection of things that went around Motown. And so when we talk about STEM education and the need for technology and math and engineering training, I know that's totally true. But to me, the people who have always been the most successful are those that are able to connect the creativity to the engineering and the technology. That was something that Steve Jobs said every single product launch he did. He would get up on stage, and at the very last slide, there'd be a street signs intersecting, and it'd be the intersection of the humanities and technology. And he said, that's what sets Apple apart, is that we are the people who are connecting the notion of beauty and creativity. I realized when Steve Jobs was talking to me about that, I had written quite a few other books. I'd done Ben Franklin and Albert Einstein, and that's when he called and said, why don't you do me next? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Franklin, Einstein, you, you, uh, at, well, I won't go into, and I said, I'll think I'll wait, you know, 20 or 30 years and do it uh, when you retire. And only a few weeks later was I told, if you want to do Steve, you have to do him now, because he had just been diagnosed with the cancer. And it was from him 
that I realize a very simple thing about innovation and technology, which is that beauty matters. Those of you who remember the original iPod probably have trouble remembering the one that Microsoft came out with at the same time, called the Zune. The big difference is the iPod was a thing of absolute beauty. The Zune looked like it had been made by people in basements in Uzbekistan and, you know, <laughs> had no sense of the humanity connecting to it. And it was when Steve Jobs was creating that iPod that he realized the simplicity of making something a friendly, easy consumer interface. That was his creativity. He said to his engineers, I want to be able to get to any song I want in three clicks. And they said, fine, fine, but we need to do the artists and the album and the this. And they said, no, three clicks, don't show it to me unless you can do it in three clicks. Finally, they came up with that beautiful device, the track wheel, so intuitive you could just roll it and the songs would come up. And he said, that's great, but what's this little button on top? They're afraid to answer him because finally, you know, Tony Fidel says, uh, Steve, that's the on-off switch. And Steve says, what does it do? And Fidel says, oh, it turns it on and off. <laughs> and Steve says, why do we need it? And it slowly dawned on them, you don't need that. Your uh, iPod is smart enough to power itself down when you quit using it. When you start using it again, it powers back up. And that was the notion that an intuitive way of connecting humans to technology would always be the recipe for innovation. So after that, I went back, and then first of all, I looked at all the other people I'd written about, Ben Franklin, people like that, and I realized, yes, that was always the key to their success. They loved science. They loved invention. But even Einstein, when he was stumped, would take out his violin and play Mozart when he needed to connect with the harmonies of the spheres. So I started to look at this beautiful connection and this concept of creativity and how it comes from connecting the different silos of the humanities to our engineering. Went back first to Ada Lovelace, who was probably the person most influential at inventing the concept of a general purpose computer. Ada was Lord Byron's daughter, only, only legitimate child. And uh, when she was growing up, you know, she had the poetry that came from her father being such a great romantic poet. But her mother, Lady Byron, had her tutored only in mathematics because at that point, Lady Byron wasn't all that fond of Lord Byron. If you know anything about Lord Byron, he's a little bit too much of a romantic poet. And so Lady Byron thought that mathematics training would be an antidote to being a romantic poet. But what Ada did was connect the notion into what she called poetical science. She used to love going to the Midlands of England in the 1830s, looking at the weaving looms that were using punch cards to create beautiful patterns. And she saw the connection of the beauty and the technology and how it was working. Her father, Lord Byron, was a Luddite. And I mean that absolutely literally. The only speech he gives in the House of Lords is defending the followers of Ned Ludd, who were smashing those looms on the theory that technology would put people out of work. They were wrong then, and they're wrong now. One of the things to being a great innovative city is to understand how to harness technology to your creativity, as opposed to being somebody who tries to resist the advent of technology. So what Ada did is she went around and looked at these looms and realized that the punch cards that ran those looms could be used on a friend of hers calculating machine that he was building. And it could make it so that the calculating machine could do more than just numbers. It could do as she put anything notated in symbols. Words, music, patterns, art, numbers, in other words, punch cards could create a general purpose computer. She even published it, which was unusual in the 1830s for a woman to be published in a scientific journal in England. But she published it, and she had only one caveat. 
And that was the human connection caveat, I call it, the creativity caveat, is that machines will be able to do anything that can be notated in symbols, except they'll never be able to be creative. They can only follow the rules. She called them the algorithms that we would give them. Now, exactly 100 years later, Alan Turing wrote another piece. When I did a book on the innovators, I wanted to make Alan Turing a little bit more famous as well. But the week before my book came out, he was played by Benedict Cumberbatch in The Imitation Game. So he got to be famous all on his own without anybody having to read the chapter on him in my book. But the interesting part of that chapter is that Turing refers to Lady Lovelace's objection. And he says machines will be able to think. They'll be able to do things without us. That was the whole point of the imitation game, that at some point you'd never be able to tell a machine from a human. That was 60 years ago, and he had the Turing test that was going to show it. Well, despite what people probably on this stage have told you, artificial intelligence has never actually surpassed the combination of human creativity with machines. The ability of humans connected with their creativity to machines has always outpaced in and productivity ever since then, ever since the advent of history, what machines alone could progress and do. So that gets us to the notion of the connection of the creativity uh, to the technology. Whenever you need to do something like that, the core is to remember that beauty really matters, that it's your creativity you're pouring into a thing that matters. Steve Jobs, when we first started working together, he made me walk around the backyard of his house and put his hand on a fence that his father had helped him build when he was six years old. He said, my father told me we had to make the back of the fence just as beautiful as the front of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And his father said, yes, but you will know. And his point was that beauty mattered. And so when Steve made the original Macintosh computer, he spent a whole lot of time creating that beautiful curved case. He went to Macy's to look at Cuisine Arts to figure out exactly how the curve should work. He, had the, he made me, when I was first met him in the early 1980s, use a jeweler's loop to look at every pixel on the screen and how it made beautiful icons. But right before they finished designing it, he looked at the circuit board inside. And he said, well, this circuit board is ugly. And the engineers said, what are you talking about? He said, well, it's not beautiful. The chips aren't lined up straight. And they're, you know, they're not. And they said, Steve, that's ridiculous, by the way. And nobody can even open the machine. Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And he told the story of his father and the fence. He said, yes, but you will know. So they held up shipping the original Macintosh for four weeks until they could make the circuit board inside beautiful. And when they did, Steve had everybody sign a little whiteboard, all 30 engineers on the Mac team, with Stephen P. Jobs, and all in lowercase, the way he wrote his name in the middle. And they engraved it on the inside of the case, because he said, real artists sign their work. Nobody would ever see it, nobody would ever know. But it was just a symbol that you have to add the beauty and the cre creativity uh, to the technology. You know, and as going back and looking at it, as Patty said, I'm trying to do, I'm doing a book that'll be out in October on Leonardo da Vinci. And the reason I'm doing him is he's the ultimate icon of standing at the intersection of the humanities and engineering. It's the ultimate icon of connecting beauty to technology. In fact, Vitruvian Man, you know, the naked guy doing jumping jacks in the circle and square, that uh, drawing he did, is the symbol and the icon of that. And he always felt that those who can combine the arts and the sciences with those who were going to be, were value, and beauty and innovation is created. And to me, that's the first lesson, and that's the recipe that I think has done more than anything else to bring Detroit back in the beautiful way that it's starting to come back. The thing about Vitruvian Man, that drawing, is that we biographers often distort history. 
We know that is a little secret, a dirty secret. We make it seem like an artist goes up into a garret or an engineer goes out into a garage and they have a light bulb moment and innovation happens. That gets me though to my second point, which is that innovation's a team sport. It requires collaboration. Even Vitruvian Man, I discovered when doing this book, other people have written about it as, oh, you know, Leonardo does this amazing drawing. He did it with three friends. They had lots of dinners. They traveled from Milan to Pavia to look at a cathedral. They all did drawings of this, which our others, you know, were able to find. And they did it by sitting around at dinners and figuring out how man is connected to the cosmos, the beauty of human proportions, and how it connects us to things larger than ourselves. And I realized that even Leonardo, the greatest of all visionary geniuses, was somebody who collaborated, whether it was on Virgin of the Rocks, in which it's almost hard to tell in the two versions of it, what was done by his colleagues and what was done by himself, to his engineering, to the thing he loved best was theater and plays and creating ingenious devices for the theater. All of that gave him a sense of collaboration. And that ability to collaborate helped him bring together the diversity of the people around him at the time. And that gets to what the mayor was talking about yesterday, which is the inclusivity that collaboration demands of us, bringing people from different backgrounds together. With all due respect to Detroit, the highest time in history that ever happened was Florence in 1500, where the Ottoman Empire is falling, all sorts of immigrants are coming in from the Middle East, they're bringing things like algebra uh, and new ways of doing math. And Florence has all these people who are a little bit of misfits, as uh, Steve Jobs would call them, rebels, round pegs in the square holes. People like Michelangelo and Leonardo who were, you know, dropouts and gay and flamboyant and all sorts of different backgrounds, and it was that ferment of Florence in 1500 that helps bring the Italian Renaissance and the whole Renaissance to a pinnacle. And so that ability to work together and to form teams, to me, has always been the second great ingredient. It's another thing that Detroit did, and it's one thing that happened to us in New Orleans, which is learning at a certain point after the levees break that we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat, so to speak. So we look at each form of collabor uh, collaboration that has done creativity. You can look at the most important inventions of our time, of our day and age. The computer, the microchip, the internet. And with all due respect to Al Gore, nobody knows who invented them. Why? <laughs> because they were invented collaboratively collaboratively as parts of teams. For example, take the internet. The internet was uh, created by the Defense Department and its Advanced Research Projects Agency in order to help connect the great computers that they were funding at research universities, including Michigan, around the country. And in order to connect those computers, they needed to have ways to direct the little packets that they figured out would scurry through the network from node to node. And so they told the universities, the research universities, we're going to have this network and you're going to have these computers, but you all have to figure out a way to connect them over this uh, intranet and internet and internetworking devices. And so they did what uh, research professors always do. They assigned the tasks to their graduate students. And there was a team of 30 graduate students that decided that the way the internet needed to be designed needed to be designed purely collaboratively so that it was not a top-down thing as the Defense Department may have wanted. This is the late 1960s. They're kind of anti-authoritarian. You know, they do not want it to be a hierarchy. They want it to be peer-to-peer -peer, and they want it to be done in a collaborative way. So they get the youngest of the graduate students, a guy named Steve Crocker, not to write the rules and regulations that they agree upon, but just to take notes. And they want to do it as a team. They move from town to town, having meetings every few months. 
And Steve Crocker decided, I don't want to call these regulations. I don't want to call these rules. I don't want to make it seem like it was top-down imposed. So finally, he comes up with the idea of calling them requests for comment. In other words, if the little packet, they come up with the idea that it should have an address header and it should break up this way and the address header should recombine it when it gets to the place and what happens if a packet doesn't make it, all those things that make the internet what it is, they're not called rules, they're called requests for comment. Now that's pretty cool that that's the way they built the internet in this collaborative fashion. But what's particularly cool is this is the way we're still building, building the internet. The RFC process is up to RFC 7900 and we're still doing it in this collaborative way. When I was at Time Magazine, we said that it was done that way in order to survive a Russian nuclear attack. Because if you design something that way and you, it was a central hub and you take out that hub, it could really mess up your network. But if you design it the way the graduate students did, you take out a node, it doesn't matter. The internet knows how to route around the broken node. And uh, we got a letter from Steve Crocker who said, no, no, no. That's not why we did it that way. You know, we weren't doing it to help the Pentagon fight a war. I mean, we were graduate students in the late 1960s. You know, why were we graduate students? We were dodging the draft. You know, we were not there to <laughs> help build a war fight. So, and and you know, he said, uh, I wrote a letter to Time, you know, saying this. Time didn't print it. When I went back to interview him, he told me about that. So I decided to go to my friends at Time Magazine and say, who was the better source that we had back then that we used instead of Steve Crocker? And they looked it up in the folder. There was a guy named Steve Lukasich who actually ran the DARPA information office at the Pentagon. I talked to him and he said, yeah, we were doing it to help you know, prevent a collapse in the case of a war with Russia. Uh, we didn't tell the graduate students that. They were all draft evaders, you know, so, but we, you know, but that's why we were doing it that way. I couldn't have gotten money out of the Congress or the colonels at the Pentagon just to allow a few graduate students to play games on their computers. He said, go tell Crocker that he was on the bottom and I was on the top and he didn't know what was happening. So I do. And Crocker looks at me over a cup of coffee and nods and he says, you tell Lukasich that I was on the bottom and he was on the top, so he didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and that's the essence of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration that is designed into the DNA, it's ingrained into the genetic code of the way the internet works, which requires almost, as those of you and almost everyone in this room has businesses, you know that the notion of a pure top-down hierarchy even, I was spending a lot of time with uh, people at Ford, Bill Ford and others recently. Top-down hierarchies no longer work as well in the age of collaboration. And so that notion of collaboration is the most important ingredient besides creativity. Because it takes a creative individual to have great vision. But vision without execution is hallucination. And that's what happens too often in our society where people don't know how to form teams. I remember near the end of his life in August 2011, in the summer when Steve was fighting uh, his cancer, I decided to ask him what was the best you know, product, what's the best thing he ever made at Apple. I thought he'd say the iPhone or the iPad or maybe the Macintosh. He said, no, he said, you weren't listening to me. This is the way he always talked. He said, creating a good product is hard, but what's really hard is creating a team that will continue to create great product. The best thing I did at Apple was create the team that could create good products. And it was that passion for creativity and the type of leading a team into a breach that really made his company so innovative back when Apple was doing these products. And for him, it required what they sometimes called a reality distortion field. That's the type of passion you need to bring a team to do things it didn't know it would be able to do. One of the parts of my book is that he was a pretty tough leader. He could be a jerk at times. They actually have a word 
out in Silicon Valley that begins with an A uh, that's even nastier for what he was. But in my book, I say, yes, he could be a jerk at times. He pushed me. He drove me to distraction. But he also drove me to do things I didn't know I'd be able to do. And that's why he's there. Some people sometimes come up to me after a talk and say, I'm like Steve Jobs. You know, I drive people to distraction. I push. I said, yeah, yeah, but you know, have you ever made the iPod or the iPhone? <laughs> you have to push them to do great things. And that's what Steve was able to do. That reality distortion field started early on when he was uh, working with Wozniak, his friend at Atari. And they decided they had to do a video game. And uh, Steve says to Woz, you got to code it by this weekend because we got to get back to the Apple farm where we work. That's hence the name of the company they eventually f founded. Woz said, Steve, you don't even know how to code that well. I can't do it in four days. It could take me a couple of weeks. Steve had gone to uh, India and found a guru when he dropped out of college. And the guru had taught him to stare without blinking. And he would just stare. And he stared at Woz and said, don't be afraid. You can do it. Woz said, I got so freaked out that I went back to my little workman. <laughs> and stayed up three nights in a row, and we coded the game Breakout. Over and over again, you hear these stories about that sort of thing. When the original um, Mac came out, it took 95 seconds to boot up. It was almost as slow as a Microsoft machine. So Steve says to uh, the engineer, Larry Kenyon, you got to shave 20 seconds off the boot up time. Kenyon says that. Steve just stares at him without blinking. He says, don't be afraid. You can do it. Kenyon said, OK, I went back to my cubicle. And after a couple of weeks, I had shaved 40 seconds off the boot up time. Over and over, finally, uh, on the uh, original iPhone, he didn't want it to have a junky plastic cover. So he asked around, and he wanted glass that so would be really smooth. And finally, somebody pointed him to Corning, said, maybe Corning can do it for you. And he talked to Wendell Weeks, who was the, is the CEO of Corning. He said, I need this type of glass. I won't smudge. After they went through it for a while, Weeks said to him, you know, we once invented a process called Gorilla Glass. And uh, it would sort of do what you want. In fact, if we did it this way, it could do what you want. We never made it, but we have it. And Steve said, OK, I need this much by October, because we're going to ship at the end of that month. And we said, I just told you, we've never made this before. We can't do it by October. And um, I actually went to Corning, New York, to actually hear this firsthand, because I'm one of those old-fashioned reporters. Weeks said it was totally amazing. The guy just kept staring at me without <laughs> blinking and saying, don't be afraid. You can do it. The upshot is that October, every iPhone, everyone in your pocket had Glass made by Corning on it. And so since then, has every iPhone, an iPad, every device made in America by Corning because Steve Jobs pushed his reality distortion field. And finally, there's a notion I said about civility, about being civic. And this is a lesson Detroit can now teach everybody. Whether it's the governor, the mayor, the former mayor, everybody been involved. It's the notion that we're all in something larger together. Ben Franklin was the apostle of that. When he was a young tradesman trying to bring Philadelphia up, he created a group not too much different than what Sandy and you all have created here that he called the Leather Apron Club, which was just business leaders, shopkeepers to all get together, figure out what problems they had to face. They made a list of the virtues and values that they each had to abide by in order to make a greater city. If you've read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, you'll see the list in it. Industry, honesty, frugality. And he, every week, he would check off whether he had mastered each of those 12 virtues that he listed. At one point, he had mastered all 12 in a given week. And he showed it around to the members of the Leather Apron Club quite proudly. And uh, one of the members said, you know, Franklin, you've forgotten a virtue you might want to put on the list. And Frank said, what's that? And the friend says, humility. You might want to add that one. <laughs> now, Franklin says, and this is why I love Ben Franklin, I was never very good at the virtue of humility. I never mastered it.
but I was very good at the pretense of humility. I could fake it very well. Now, but no, but here's the genius part. And he said, and I learned that the pretense of humility was just as useful as the reality of humility. Because it made you listen to the person next to you, made you try to find the common ground. And that was the essence of the middle class democracy we were trying to create back then. So it was that type of civic leadership that balances the role of the individual, liberties and freedom, with the role of the community and says these are not pulling us apart. We have to join these together. You know, he did that throughout his life. When they were creating a declaration to say why we were having the revolution, Congress appointed a committee to explain why. It was the last time Congress created a good committee. It had Ben Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson on it. Jefferson starts writing that great second sentence, greatest sentence ever written by man. We hold these truths to be sacred, he wrote. It was a collaborative process. You see Benjamin Franklin with his pen crossing out the word sacred and putting in self-evident, saying we're trying to create a new type of, uh, of government that depends on the consent of the governed, not the dogmas of religion to give us our rights. But the sentence goes on, and they're endowed with certain inalienable rights. See, John Adams' handwriting on the first draft, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. You see them balancing in a collaborative teamwork way this role of religion and the role of rationality and reason in creating our government. He did that all the way through, even at the Constitutional Convention, when they're pulling each other apart on the big state, little state issue. He finally says, when we were young tradesmen here in Philadelphia, we'd get together in our economic forums, and if something didn't work, if we had a joint of wood that didn't fit together, you'd take from one side, then you'd shave from the other side, and you had a joint that would pull together for centuries. And so we here, too, at this convention, must each part with some of our demands, and he comes up with the compromise of a House and a Senate that they vote on. His point was that compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. That's some of the collaboration we've f forgotten about these days. On his deathbed, Benjamin Franklin had given to the building fund of each and every church built in Philadelphia. And at one point, they were building a new hall next to Independence Hall. And um, he wrote the fundraising document. It said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to come here and preach Islam to us, and to teach us about the prophet Muhammad, we should offer a pulpit and we should listen, for we might learn. And on his deathbed, he was the largest individual contributor to the Mikveh Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. So when he died, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests of Philadelphia linked arms with the rabbi of the Jews and marched with him to the grave. It was that type of civility, that type of sense of community, that type of inclusive growth and inclusive democracy that they were fighting for back then and we're still fighting for it around the world and here at home. Thank you all very much. Joining Walter Isaacson on stage, please welcome columnist and associate business editor for the Detroit News, Daniel Howes. So a great welcome. journalist who's been spending a lot of time this past couple of weeks yeah, been, on big stories yeah, here. Big stories. Thank you for being here, Brian. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, you wrote the book on Steve Jobs. Uh, you've spent time uh, with Ford Motor. You, you talked mm -hmm. about that earlier. I'm going to get into Ford in a second, but one of the things I think, and a lot of us, I think, in this room think, is that the Detroit versus Silicon Valley is kind of the epic battle of our time. Absolutely. So my question to you is very simple. Who's going to win? Okay, let me define what I think the battle is, okay. and I'll tell you. This battle has happened before. It's a battle of who controls a great innovation. The makers of the hardware right. or the makers of the software. Is it going to be, in the case of the automobile, those at Google and other places that are creating the software that will create autonomous vehicles, or will the car companies sort of own the product, own the brand. 
Now, we've seen this movie before. It's why Bill Gates was so successful. Is that everybody thought the people who made the computer, mm -hmm. whether it be Compaq or, you know, K-Pro, only you and I remember those names, and uh, I don't know, there were some others back then. Uh, but Bill Gates said, no, it's going to be the person who types the code for the operating system, and he creates DOS and then Windows, and that commoditizes for a long time the hardware makers. Whether you're Compact or Hewlett Packard or Dell or whatever, it didn't really matter. People didn't care because the people who really made the money were the people, Microsoft in particular, but Apple as well, who wrote the software. So that's the battle happening here in the auto industry. I do think that the answer will be the car companies if they collaborate, if they figure out how to do it right, and they say, we are not going to allow one company, be it Google or any other company, to come up with the software and we'll just build the hardware around it. We're going to say, we're going to not do what um, the computer companies did, which is license Microsoft, but let them create the standard. We're going to own our own software. It's got to be the way Steve Jobs did, which was an end-to-end -end. when he did Apple. Right. The hardware and the software were integrated into a thing of perfect beauty, so you had to have the end-to-end -end integration. Because you see the big players, the General Motors, Ford, Toyota, the Germans uh, developing their own, more or less. Right. The second tier players are the ones who are more interested in collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that means that the second tier guys may come out on top because they cut deals with Google, like FCA is? is well, it depends on the Google. deal they cut. In other words, if, they, if IBM had cut a better deal with uh, Microsoft, IBM would be the dominant player in computers. But they allowed Microsoft to own the operating system and just as opposed to selling it outright to IBM. I guess I should explain it a little bit better, which is it's those, whoever end-to-end -end integrates best. In other words, the reason Apple devices are and were so good is that the software and the hardware are, t you don't have to like load the iOS operating system into your iPhone. It's totally integrated. That's the way most consumers want it, because it makes a more beautiful product and a simpler product. So the car companies have got to get the best operating systems, collaborating with whoever it may be who's going to create them, but then own that and integrate it into their cars instead of just allow Google to license it and they own the software. You were at the, you were at the auto show in, in January, um, I think on the stage, if I remember right, with Bill and, and Mark Fields. Um, I was playing your role. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious, six months later, uh, there's a new CEO. This happened very, very quickly. Uh, the same day as a board meeting, it was done, uh, had a new CEO. Uh, what kind of lessons do you think? Well, first are? of all, one lesson is that Bill Ford's a very good leader. He actually knows a lot about what's happening. He's not just a chairman, but an executive chairman. And when we talked both backstage and on stage, it was very clear that he knew cloud computing, mobility, ride sharing. You're at a total inflection point in the auto industry, with the two big ones being autonomous vehicles and then the Uberization, the ride sharing. Will there be personal cars, mainly as our system, 10 years from now, or will most cars be kind of shared? Will they be autonomous? That's, Bill Ford was thinking about that and really ahead of it. Now, the new CEO was also there, and he was talking about Ford Mobility. He was bringing out Chariot. Chariot involves not only autonomous driving, but sharing driving. In New Orleans on the City Planning Commission, we're now talking about why do we even need transit systems? Why don't we just have autonomous vehicles picking people up on demand when people punch their phone saying, I'm trying to get to work, figure it out that way, let companies compete. You're seeing a whole new world, and Bill Ford was getting that, and I got the sense, I wish I had been a more of a journalist, and I got the sense even back then that the thing that was really interesting him was Ford Mobility. I think that's true, and I think the feeling was that things weren't moving uh, quickly enough. I'm curious, in your writing and, and reading of history, whether you think old line institutions, like some of these car companies, they're over 100 years old, uh, can innovate and, and move quickly enough in an environment that's moving at a lot greater speed than they are historically accustomed to. That is the key question of our time, which is whether big, name big companies that have been able to pirouette and to you know, dance really fast 
Uh, you know, IBM has done it sometimes well. It's been around more than 100 years. Uh, but if you look at the major companies today, you look at the top 10 major companies, they're all ones that didn't exist exactly. 10, 15 years ago. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, you know, whatever, Netscape. So uh, we don't see many examples of old line institutions you know, where I began, you know, Time Incorporated, you know, try to find, you Point know, taken. Yeah, I, I know what it's like being on the side of a big corporation. And why did we not innovate? I was part of what you could call the Time Inc. Mobility Lab, meaning the Time Inc. New Media Lab. And I kept getting pushback, we did, you know, from higher ups that, oh, if we put everything on the internet, that'll cannibalize what we do. And so the fear big companies have is they'll cannibalize their existing revenue streams. Steve Jobs woke up one morning after he did the iPod. The iPod was so successful, it was dominating the earnings of Apple for a while, having a thousand songs in your pocket and a, movie player, a, a music player. And he was worried. So he comes in and he says, is the brain dead people who make cell phones ever come to their senses? They'll put music on cell phones and we'll be toast. So we're gonna create a cell phone, i.e. the iPhone, that has your music on it. And the people with the iPod group at Apple were saying, no, that will destroy our baby. He said, well, if we don't cannibalize ourselves, somebody else somebody is going to eat our lunch. That's the mentality that big corporations have been afraid to implement. They protect their existing revenue stream. I would guess Ford might, and, and GM, I mean, they're doing quite well, they may get out of that innovator's dilemma trap that Clay Christensen writes about. I think they're, I think they're trying to. And I think that's part of what, why Ford did what it did as quickly as they did. You know, the great innovators in, in Silicon Valley, Elon Musk, uh, yeah. Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey at Twitter, of course, Steve Jobs. Do these, in your experience, do you think they think about the ethical implications of some of the things that they're creating? And I think one of the great examples is Facebook Live, where all of a sudden they went, it went live and people were, there were murders that were being broadcast live over the yeah. internet. And I think Zuckerberg, from what I've read, just went, oh my God, what, you, what are we doing here? Uh, right. Are there ethical concerns? I mean, yeah. a lot of this has implications for employment uh, for a lot of people over time. Yeah, uh, first of all, I don't think you can get too hung up on saying, okay, this might hurt employment. We don't know whether productivity will find new forms of jobs. As you said, you know, productivity and technology sometimes seems to put people out of work, like autonomous vehicles might. Yet, as people like Mark Andreessen say, we don't know what that new productivity will create new jobs. We never knew that mm -hmm. search engine optimization would be a job in the future, so to speak. Um, ethical. Uh, I don't want to paint with a total broad brush. I mean, Steve Jobs, when he was dying, talked about it's not what you take out of the river, it's what you put into the river for other people using. So I think he had a deep moral sense. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg does, as you say, which is he keeps being surprised about the bad things that happened because of social networking uncontrolled, and now he's searching, I mean, traveling across America, mm -hmm. trying to figure it out. I admire him for that. However, there is in Silicon Valley, for better or worse, a deep libertarian streak, which is don't try to tell us what to do, don't regulate us, anti-government, whether it's Uber, or Airbnb, Facebook, Google, whatever it may be. And that libertarian streak can be moral, but it also can be amoral. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're seeing the struggle, not only within Facebook, but within Mark Zuckerberg's own mind as he's trying to navigate this. He's just a young guy still, yeah, at least is. compared to me and you. Compared to us. <laughs> yeah, um, the, uh, the chamber says, you know, they want to restore civility in politics. You were talking at the end yeah. here about civility and about Franklin. Um, is the problem the politicians or is the problem the consumers, the people, the people that are on these Facebook, that use, that take to social media, yeah. that say things they would, in a lot of cases, never say to your face. Right. Uh, I was just talking to Debbie Dingle, who I think could be a, uh, she was just here, a voice of uh, civility. There are a lot of technological and other reasons why this has happened. You put your finger on one of them, which is anonymity online. Mm -hmm. I am a, um, on the bad side of my daughter's generation, everything else, which is I don't believe that anonymity or as they call it, privacy, 
is totally holy, that I actually think you should be responsible for your own words. And the fact that you can do things online totally anonymously, I think helps poison our discourse. If you don't believe me, open up your Twitter feed and start reading the comments or your Facebook or whatever it may be. Uh, that was a flaw when I talked about the original 30 graduate students who invented the internet. They thought about not only addressing the packets to say where they should go, right. but also saying where they had where come they from. from. You would have had a totally different world if everybody had to take responsibility for whatever they put online. Uh, Plato in the Republic talks about the Ring of Gyges. You put it on, you're anonymous. Nobody can see you. He says, will we still be civil? His answer is no. We wouldn't be as civil if we were anonymous. And I think the internet's proving him right. Now, there's a dozen other reasons, and we don't have the time to go into it, from gerrymandering to the media, which is balkanized into mm -hmm. far left and far right echo chambers. All these things have led to a decrease in civility. Uh, so it's not like we can just do something like that and the civility comes back. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Do you think it's going to get, just continue to get worse and spiral downward? No. Einstein saw this happen in the uh, early 1950s when he came to America, having fled the Nazis and the communists and all. And he watched the McCarthy era. And in the McCarthy era, his friend, J. Robert Oppenheimer, loses his security. Einstein can no longer work on nuclear you know, things, nuclear weapons, even though he had come up with E equals MC squared, the formula, and written the letter to Roosevelt because of the red scares and Joe McCarthy, the McCarthyism. And he said, this is, I've seen this happen before. America's going to fall off of a cliff, just like Germany did, in a letter to his son, he wrote. And then a couple years later, the press, to give him credit, meaning Edward R. Edward Murrow, R. Murrow. Yep. the politicians, meaning Dwight Eisenhower, all of a sudden, they knock McCarthyism away, knock it off stage. And Einstein says, America democracy, it's amazing. It's like a gyroscope. Just when you think it's going to fall over, it knows how to right itself. Uh, I'm a historian, so if it's happened every single time, I believe it's going to continue to happen. And I still think we now have a yearning to right ourselves. Final question. Uh, in all of your writing, I'm particularly interested in how it applies to Steve Jobs. What's the single most important quality that a leader has to have to lead the collaborative team that you're talking about? Not to lead from the top down yeah. in the old style. I think it's the ability to use Steve Jobs' slightly ungrammatical phrase, to think different. Uh, you know, to say, all right, we're going to be crazy enough to think we can change the world. In my biography of Steve, I talk about all the times he just was able to think out of the box. When Einstein is a patent clerk, because he can't get a job you know, anywhere else of teaching, because they can't figure out what he's talking about, um, <laughs> he's looking at devices to synchronize clocks. And he realizes if you're traveling really fast, what looks synchronized to you is going to look different to somebody else. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but not much. And he says, I get it. The speed of light is always constant, but time is relative, depending on your state of motion. That challenged the very first sentence of the Bible, almost, which was Newton's Principia, which says time marches along second by second, no matter how you observe it. And you got this patent clerk saying, how would you test that? How would you know it? He's thinking different. And the ultimate, and I end with this, the ultimate is Leonardo. I mean, when I started writing about Leonardo, he only finishes maybe 15 paintings. He gives up on some. Throws, he designs things like the helicopter, the diversion of rivers, a hundred things you can mention that don't quite, that are almost fantasies. And for a while, I think, well, that's a flaw. He's overreaching. He's trying to design things that it'll take another century or two for us to really create. But I realized that even his ability to fantasize, to have a reality distortion field, Leonardo, Einstein, Steve Jobs, that's what connected them all, is that they saw things that are unseen. They kind of fantasized, and they got really ahead of things. I do add this note of caution. As I said, people sometimes come up, say, I'm like Steve Jobs. They also come up like, I'm like Einstein. I think different. I think out of the box. 
And I do say, yeah, but he knew what was in the box before he thought <laughs> out of it. Thank Thanks, you, Walter Isaacson. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen.